Uh, well, as you said, I am the collection manager and senior map librarian at National. Sorry, this is going to be a little bit awkward for me because I, I have a lot of notes on the computer. And... All right. Um, I am the collection manager and senior map librarian at National Geographic, and I'm here to tell you about a map, part of the Grand Canyon, which is a, part, a version of which is on display on the back wall there. Um, we, National Geographic, published this map in 1928, but the idea for it came from uh, Brad Washburn. He was um, the project director for it, and he managed the process, the entire process, from beginning to end. In it's commonly said. Um, seven years, it's really closer to eight when you think about when he first started buying aerial photos for it. Um, but he managed the process beginning to end and he's really the guy that you should think about when you think about this map. Um, before I start, I want to give you a, a quick warning. Um, when National Geographic first agreed to help fund Washburn do this project, uh, Washburn wrote a letter to the society's president and said, hey, I think you should consider doing an article in the magazine about this. And the president at the time uh, then forwarded that note on to the, the, uh, the magazine editor, Gil Grosvenor, and he said, in effect, we both know that Washburn has a lot of crazy ideas about what should go in the magazine, but this is actually an idea that might work. Uh, if you agree, please consider it. And Grosvenor took the idea to the planning council for the magazine, who considered it and wrote back to say, quote, None of us felt that an article on the making of a map, even of the Grand Canyon, would interest more than a handful of members. So uh, as much as I appreciated your comments this morning, Map, about people being rock stars, it, it was or it was the considered opinion of National Geographic Magazine, one of the most beloved and trusted resources and publications in the world, that most of you uh, in 30 minutes will look at yourselves and think that you had just better have gone to lunch. All right, a little bit about National Geographic. We were originally founded in 1988 as an organization devoted to the increase and diffusion of geographic information. Our founders, 33 of them, were a distinguished group of geographers, military men, scientists, and explorers, including a couple of army officers who had played outsized roles in the exploration of the canyon. And I should point out here, too, that the earlier version of this slide also had Grove Carl Gilbert labeled, as well as um, Henry Gannett. So there was a pretty big contingent of U.S. guys, U.S. military map makers who were godfathers of U.S. cartography. In pursuit of our mission at National Geographic, we've awarded more than 13,000 grants to thousands of people, oceanographers, archaeologists, polar explorers, paleoanthropologists, and mountain climbers, among many others. People like Robert Peary, Jacques Cousteau, and Jane Goodall, people who you might know from National Geographic magazine or from perhaps uh, a TV special starting in the 1960s. We may be best known for pictures, but cartography is an essential part of our history too. We've published maps in the very first issue of National Geographic, even before pictures made it in, and we've now created more than 7,000 unique maps for the magazine, including 500 pull-out supplements. Brad Washburn's long relationship with National Geographic began in 1930 with a lecture he gave about mountain climbing in the Alps. He was 19 years old at the time, and he'd already climbed Mount Blanc and the Matterhorn, as well as the subject of, of that night's lecture, a, a summit called the Green Needle. In college, Washburn funded his climbing expeditions with money he was earning on the lecture circuit. In 1934, newly graduated from Harvard, Harvard led the first expedition to successfully climb southeast Alaska's Mount Krillin. The next year, the Geographic sent a team, led by Washburn, to study, photograph, and map a 5,000 square mile expanse of territory along the Alaska-Yukon border. Washburn later conducted the first photographic flights of Mount McKinley. These expeditions were documented by articles in National Geographic magazine, each of which was photographed and written by Washburn himself. Over the years, Washburn grew accustomed to working in extreme conditions. He once described the difficulty of standing atop Mount McKinley's south summit at more than 20,000 feet above sea level 
and in temperatures at 20 below zero, and trying to set up and operate survey equipment. Quote, it is well nigh impossible to operate a delicate theodolite with gloves on. Because bare metal cannot be safely touched with ungloved hands in sub-zero weather, we cover the tangent screws, leveling screws, and other adjustable parts with adhesive tape. I worked with my left hand in a big mitten and my right completely bare. After three or four minutes, I would put my bare hand under my armpit to warm it up while the recorder checked his figures, and then I'd go to work again. Washburn's survey and photo work culminated in the first map of Mount McKinley, published in 1960. He later directed a project, funded by the Geographic, to make a large-scale map of the region around Mount Kennedy. Canada's Mount Kennedy, excuse me. Washburn had actually discovered Mount Kennedy 30 years earlier on his Yukon expedition. And he relied heavily on aerial photography and newly obtained survey data to make the map. Not long after Washburn had completed his map on the Mount, his work on the Mount Kennedy map, he and his wife Barbara came to, came to uh, Grand Canyon. And they were, as he put it, disturbed by the fact that they could find no large scale maps of the area. The best available were updated editions of the map you just heard about from Dr. Upchurch. Washburn's response, typical, was to make one himself. A large scale map depicting the maps depicting the heart of the Grand Canyon, stretching from about the south rim to a point three and a half miles above the, above the Colorado River. At a scale of one to 4,800, far greater than any previous map, it would, it would cover 84 square miles and comprise several sheets that Washburn hoped would be eventually be published on a smaller scale as a single sheet. To pay for it, he would use his research fund the, from the Boston Museum of Science, where he had been the director since 1939, and he would spread the labor and expenses out over a number of years. Washburn was excited to try mapping the Grand Canyon, quote, it not only represents extremely detailed exploration of some of the wildest topography on Earth, but also involves some interesting research to determine the best techniques to depict the canyon in such a way that the end result will be totally accurate and precise from the scientific user, or excuse me, from the standpoint of the scientific user, yet beautiful, interesting, and useful for the layman and the hiker. Washburn's first step, naturally, was to acquire black and white aerial photos of the canyon. Begin beginning in 1970, he arranged to have flights taken from 26,000, 16,000, 12,000, and finally from 8,500 feet, an altitude low enough to capture important details such as roads, buildings, mule trails, footpaths, and vegetation. It didn't take long, however, for Washburn to realize that his, his me relatively meager research fund from the Boston Museum of Science was not going to support his vision. In October 1971, he submitted an application to the, to the Geographic's Committee on Research and Exploration, the CRE, to ask for financial support. He wrote, although I, although I cannot recollect that the National Geographic has ever been involved in this sort of joint undertaking before, I thought I would suggest it to you partly because it is the sort of thing that you would probably like, partly because the geographic has the resources and the inclination to do this thing well, and partly because you have a magnificent organization for distributing a map like this after it has been published. Washburn was optimistic that if the map were properly done, it could be, quote, an exciting addition to world cartography and represent one of the world's most magnificent cartographic challenges. By this time, Washburn was well known around the geographic for what he could bring to a project. Although, he, although it was hard to see how he might be turned down, the CRE nevertheless, nevertheless requested outside opinions on his application to assess uh, the scientific importance and the viability of it. Our chief, cartog our chief cartographer at the time, William Peel, was among those who offered his support. He wrote, it is astonishing but true that what is perhaps our most spectacular natural feature has never been mapped in the way it deserves. Washburn's project appears to be the answer to this need. Such a map would not only carry great <coughs> public appeal, but also serve a variety of scientific needs. I therefore recommend that the committee approve the application. And they did, giving him $30,000 in the first of several grants that would be used for this project. And here's where I apologize also to the people who have RGB, or I'm sorry, red, green, color blindness. On the, I'm sitting on the plane last night reviewing this, and I just suddenly, the, the, the red and the green jumped out at me, and I went, so, uh, sorry. There's, there's three maps like this that have red, 
red spots on a green background. <laughs> to achieve the kind of accuracy he sought, Washburn first had to establish adequate ground control. In other words, he had to determine the precise position and elevation of every part of the canyon that was going to appear on the map. Without this framework, the canyon as mapped would be neither precisely fixed to the Earth's surface nor accurately sized and shaped. There were existing survey marks in and around the canyon, but Washburn felt that most of them were inadequate, too old, too far away, too hard to get to. There were, however, a few that he thought were acceptable, seen here on the map, and these became the basis for his own new control network. In early 1971, Washburn, Barbara, and a team of friends and volunteers began to establish survey stations and measure the canyon. Erecting a station was a small engineering project in and of itself. Washburn first drilled a hole in the rock, then fixed a survey target. Equipment was set up, leveled, and calibrated. A white cloth was laid down to make the station visible in, in low-altitude photography. And a plastic sphere, which in, an, in another life had been the innards of a National Geographic globe, would have spray painted bright orange in order, to, in order to make it visible. From each station, Washburn and his team used a theodolite to measure horizontal and vertical angles and laser, lasers to measure distances. The data they collected allowed Washburn to calculate each station's precise coordinates as well as its elevation and distance from other stations. Each station was sighted repeatedly, perhaps a dozen or more times, and from multiple multiple excuse me, multiple locations, in order to reduce error and ensure accuracy. And I don't know how, how well you can see it if, it if the resolution is very good, but the sheet on the right is a data sheet that they collected or filled out while surveying. Uh, I think it's from Hopi, me measuring distances from Hopi, to, to Hopi Point to the survey station called Middle. And um, about halfway down the sheet, a little more than halfway down the sheet, you see that he has measure the distance seven times to a, to a ten hundredth to a thousandth of a place, and then taking the average. Washburn and his team ultimately surveyed from 92 stations located in the heart of the canyon. The stations are plotted on this map and listed in tabular form on the right, accompanied by their elevations and coordinates. Many of these stations were impractical or impossible to reach by foot, so most of the transportation was done by helicopter. Washburn and his team also walked the canyon's major trails, Bright Angel, North and South Kaibab, Clear Creek, Hermit, Tano, in order to plot their locations and record their price precise lengths. Even in low altitude photography, long segments of these trails were invisible because they were obscured by shadows and trees tucked under a rock face, which uh, you may have noticed on, on Tom's um, presentation, there was a picture of a person what, hiking, down a hill, hiking down the trail and he was com completely underneath a, a rock face. Uh, or they were f just too faint due to bare terrain or low use. Washburn farmed out some of the field checking to friends and volunteers, but he and Barbara did plenty on their own. In a letter to CRE Chairman Leonard Carmichael, Washburn once wrote, quote, working with a measuring wheel over miles and miles of rocky terrain can involve mistakes, particularly when you're hot and tired. So everything of this sort that we have completed has been done at least twice and the Bright Angel Trail we've now covered three and a half times. It's reasonable at this point to infer that Washburn was fairly detail-obsessed, but he was neither unpleasant nor impractical. He once told the volunteer who was field-checking a trail with a surveyor's wheel, quote, if you make a bad mistake, never back up, as the wheel won't reverse. Just stop and cuss a bit, or the reasonable amount, then go back to where you made your last reliable measurement, start the wheel at zero, and just start over. Sorry, I meant to point out, this is also a sheet he used while, while um, measuring Bright Angel. And you can see, I, I hope you can see, that what he does is he sets the wheel at zero, starts walking a couple hundred yards maybe to some kind of uh, notable point, a, a landmark, maybe a curve in the trail or the beginning of a tunnel, taking the, the measurement and then starting it again at zero and starting over so that every segment is short enough to redo if he needs to and, and the whole thing doesn't get spoiled if, he, if, if halfway down, if five miles in, he, he realizes he's made a mistake. This is, uh, for Bright Angel, this is page one of 17. Here's a summary of Washburn's field work. Between 1971 and 1975, he and his team made more than seven, made, one, made 712 helicopter landings and spent 144 days in the field. It wasn't unusual for them to work in the summer, 
when Washburn reported they were, that they were exposed to, to an unrelenting sun and temperatures that at times crept up to 120. He didn't report that I could see anybody having to jump up and down. <laughs> when Washburn had aerial photos and survey data collected, he sent them to Lockwood Mapping in Buffalo, New York. Lockwood managed the, managed the mechanical process, known as photogrammetry, of turning the aerial photos into a series of large-scale, poster-sized manuscripts depicting contour lines, trails, and drainage. This is part of manuscript sheet number eight. And it's, a, it's not a scan, it's a, it's a photo. Uh, thank you, Matt. Um, and it shows, I think you can get a sense of the, of the detail and the precision. Um, you can sort of understand why, why photogrammetry, why Washburn was so um, enamored of using photogrammetry for cartography. This map shows the extent of the original 17 manuscript sheets scribed by Lockwood. The total coverage is 164 miles, square miles, about twice what Washburn had originally envisioned. You may also notice that the sheets are numbered out of sequence. Numbers one through nine represent the original map as conceived, or originally, at least as originally funded by CRE. The other, uh, the next 10 through 17 represent, adi represent, addi made, represent additions made to the map. Um, subsequent to the initial grant and which required a couple of additional grants from, from the Geographic and Boston Museum. It probably won't surprise you to know that Washburn was not at all bashful about asking for things. And he was really quick to, to go back to the Geographic and say, you know what, we really, 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 really need to do this. Add this, add that, get color aerial photos. They almost always indulged him. In 1974, with the field work and photogrammetry winding down, Washburn and the Geographic turned their attention to phase two, designing a single sheet map for publication. By now, the magazine's leadership had agreed to publish the map as a supplement to the magazine, and that left Washburn to figure out what it was going to look like. From the beginning, he'd been eager to employ the same techniques pioneered by Swiss cartographers as he'd used on the McKinley and Mount Kennedy maps. If you look closely at the Mount Kennedy map, you can see a number of graphic elements that when used in combination, give the map a realistic three-dimensional quality that's consistent with the so-called Swiss style. These elements are shadows created by an oblique light source, also known as shaded relief, natural colors, which in this case is uh, kind of a blue, a very subtle blue-gray tint, black hasher marks for exposed rock, and blue hasher marks for ice falls and crevasses in the glaciers and snowfields, and contour lines rendered in blue to represent or to suggest the snow and the snow and glacier covered alpine landscape. These elements are extremely labor intensive to produce or they, they were 40 years ago, but they make for a, a very natural looking and, and striking visual uh, map. Washburn was from the very beginning extremely keen to work with a man named Paul Witzler, a cartographic relief artist from Swiss Topo. Witzker had worked with Washburn on the Mc Mount McKinley map, and Washburn regarded him enthusiastically as, quote, the number one acknowledged man in the world at painting color shaded relief. Starting in 1974 and con continuing well into 1976, Washburn, Witzker, and his colleagues at Swiss Topo and the Geographic's own cart cartographic staff debated and tested and prototyped the most appropriate method of representing the canyon, the colors, the quality of the light and the shadows, the, the spare rugged terrain, the, the layered geology, the diverse vegetation, the wandering feel, in Washburn's words, of the canyon's creeks. Washburn was passionate about making a map that was both scientifically precise and conveyed the essence and character of the canyon. And while he was tireless in his efforts to communicate that vision, he, was, he could also be rather eloquent. As he told New York Times writer and author, author John Noble Wilford, quote, if you have this kind of accuracy in all detail, the overall feeling of the country will be correct. Great precision and detail always yields extraordinary accuracy in the sense of the whole. These are four of about 20 prototypes that Witzler and Swiss Topo did sometime in 1975 and 1976. Most of them, almost all of them, are not well documented in the way that Swiss Topo gave them to me. They, in particular, they are, they are mostly undated. 
So although we have tons of correspondence in the archives, and there's a, really a lot of it going back and forth between Washington and Washburn and Switzerland and, and back and forth in circles about how should we do this? What, what, what's the palette going to look like? How do we make it, how do we depict the geology without making it look like a geologic map? How are the shadows coming out? What are we doing about this? What are we doing about that? This is the wrong direction. This is the right direction. I'm, I'm really discouraged right now. Now I'm feeling great. Um, I don't have any way to really to attach any of these to any of, of the correspondence. So I don't know what anybody thought about the thing on the left, uh, other than I can suggest that the pa palette wasn't, the color palette wasn't correct. Um, but the rest of them, I mean, the one on the right is, is to my eye, an, an almost fully formed prototype that depicts every element of the process, and, and that apparently was not sufficient. So I don't, I don't know what the problem was. Um, in any event, for reasons that are not particularly clear, Washburn eventually gave the job of painting the shaded relief to a guy named Tibor Tote. Tibor was a staff cartographer who had joined National Geographic in 1964. He'd been working in Washington on his own relief samples, just as Witzler had done in, uh, from, from Switzerland. And uh, Washburn was apparently happy enough with what Tibor had been working on that he just he gave up on having Witzler do it. So, sorry, I've just lost, my, lost the mouse, which means I can't, can't get to my own notes. Tibor was well suited to the job. He'd been trained by Swiss Topo and, and had actually done the shaded relief layer on the Mount Kennedy map a decade earlier. He also had the benefit of not being in Switzerland, which made communicating with Washburn and the rest of the geographic cartographic staff a lot easier. Using color, color aerial photos, photos that Washburn had convinced the geographic to pay for, as his guide, Tibor started working in earnest in 1976. Eleven months and more than a thousand hours later, he completed this shaded relief layer that now serves as the map, map's visual hallmark. Here's how he described the process years later. The heart of the Grand Canyon was the largest and most time-consuming relief that I painted during my 22 years on staff at National Geographic. I like to think of this work as my relief thesis because it incorporated all that I had learned about relief shading up to that point. An especially vexing problem for Washburn, the Swiss, and the geographics cartographers was how to use contour lines and color shaded relief to depict the canyon's vertical or near vertical terrain. The problem with using contour lines to depict vertical terrain is that the lines necessarily begin to bunch up and cluster into thick concentrated bands that obscure the character of the landscape rather than elucidate it. As you can see in these USGS maps, contour lines leave very little room for any other graphic element, namely color when they start to cluster up into these bands. They also do very little to illustrate the complex topography of the terrain, other than suggesting that it's, that it's vertical. And that's, that's, even, that's only if you know how to read uh, contour lines in the first place. The solution to the problem was, uh, was to complement the contour lines with cliff drawings used to represent, represent the cliffs. Here's a four panel sequence that shows exactly how the cliffs were integrated. Panel one on the left is the contour lines, the original contour line layer with segments removed where the topography was vertical or near vertical and when, where the lines would have started to bunch up and concentrate into the thick bands. Panel two shows the cliff drawings which were intended to, to slot into those areas where the contour lines had been removed. Panel three shows the combination of the two and panel four shows contours, cliff hachures, and t shaded relief. And you can see that the, the cliff drawings are suggestive of the, of the, the actual rock formations, once they, especially once they've been paired with the shaded relief. They also permit color to show through. And this meant to Washburn that the map ultimately could show, could combine the mathematical precision of the contour lines as well as the, the artistry of the shaded relief. This is a close-up view of the cliff drawings for Isis Temple. They were drawn by two Swift, Swiss Topo staff members, Alois Fleury and, and Rudolf Dauwalder, who worked about eight months 
in, in summer 1976 and into early 1977. According to Washburn, their work was, as expected, painstaking and slow. They might spend more than a day trying to depict with just the right brush strokes, too thin, too thick, um, too long, too short, too angled, to depict just a couple centimeters of cliffs. Washburn was ultimately happy. He called their work the exacting frontier between art and science. While Tibor and the Swiss labored away, <coughs> members of the ge geographics cartography staff, and there were other people, were hard at work on, this on other aspects of the map's production. Research cartographer Tom Gray worked closely with park superintendent Merle Stitt to clarify place names and compile accurate lists and locations of campgrounds, archaeological sites, ranger stations, picnic areas, and other points of interest that would, other be, that was, that would eventually appear on the map. The page, uh, the page segment here you see is from a long list of questions he sent about, about place names. Gray also worked with NAU professor Harvey Butchert, whom Washburn had recognized as the number one expert on the details of the inner reaches of the Grand Canyon. Butchert was ex especially useful in helping Gray identify and plot reliable streams and springs, which Gray hoped to distinguish on the map from those that were intermittent and seasonal. In the interest of public safety, Gray eventually removed the unre unreliable water sources from the map. In May 1978, the heart of the Grand Canyon went to press, eight years after Washburn had first purchased aerial photos. Two versions were printed, both at a scale of 1 to 24,000, or about two and a half inches to the mile. The maps are identical except for their coverage. The larger of the two maps, <coughs> Was, present, was printed approximately 34,000 times and sold for a while at the Grand Canyon and at the, at the Boston Museum of Science. The smaller, of the smaller version of the map, uh, if that's the one hanging back there, was printed, was published and distributed with the July 1978 issue of National Geographic Magazine and was therefore printed 10 and a half million times. The print run required 1.1 million pounds of paper and 17 tons of ink. Here's the large map. It seems to have been well received. Washburn himself reported shortly after publication that everything we had received ranges from ecstatic to highly complimentary. Uh, to be fair, we also re received some slightly bitter letters from, um, mostly from staff of the US Geological <laughs> Survey, who, um, who were less impressed. They felt that it was inaccurate and maybe disrespectful to Washburn's predecessors, namely Geological Survey. To, to say, as the magazine did, um, that the, magazine, that the ma canyon, quote, had never been mapped in sufficient detail for confident field views by scientists or hikers. The magazine stood firm. Uh, they, they, they said, I think rightly, that Washburn's modern methods and the large scale of the original manuscript sheets from which this published map were derived were unprecedented. Despite the map's limited coverage, it's no, by no stretch the whole canyon, it offered detail and precision that had never been seen on any map. Or as one of the editors wrote, quote, by all counts, our map is better, more accurate, more attractive, <laughs> and of greater value to the layman than any USGS map of the canyon. I, I was watching cartoons at this point, so. <laughs> uh, in any event, the Heart of the Canyon, Heart of the Grand Canyon is a fitting monument to Washburn's dedication, his tenacity, his exacting standards, not to mention his skill as a surveyor, a salesman, a, a cheerleader, and a project director. It's, it's probably top, I mean, of 7,000 plus maps, it's probably, at geographic, it's probably top five in terms of most, most lauded. And the more I, more I look into it, the more I understand why. Thank you. I can, if I have, I have one, one brief postscript to it, a couple years after uh, Washburn published, he published a, a, a final report, um, mostly about the survey and less about the cartography, and he noted that, that one of the survey stations, S61, that from which he derived most of the spot elevations on the map, was found to have been disturbed at some point pro prior to his use of it. So every, not every, but most, a lot of the spot elevations that appear on the, on the smaller version of the map are off by two feet. Um, 
subsequent additions or revisions and reprints of the larger version of the map incorporated the new values. So despite all his time in the field trying to make sure that it was within inches of correct, it was still two feet off. OK. Can you guys hear me? Yep. All right, so we have a few minutes for questions. Um, would anybody, any questions out there? Yep. So she's going to be running around. We've got one here, one there. Having started my surveying career in 1970, I recognized one of those data sheets on measurement. And I was just wondering what kind of a laser instrument was used for those distances I see it was measured to a corner prism as part of those notes. Uh, there were two. They were both laser ranger products, but I, I couldn't tell you models or, or I think I remember reading that they had one. One was donated by a, a pal of, of Washburn's and then at some point later on a second one came and I, I don't know if it was uh, version 1.1 or what the difference was. Um, it's well beyond my station in life. Um, but, I, but Laser Ranger was the product name. Is that, is that meaningful? <laughs> uh, Washburn sounds to me like someone who would have wanted to have mapped a lot more of this territory. Um, what were the constraints? Was this his vision originally, or were there constraints that, that I, limited him to this? I, from what he says, his vision was to get the most heavily touristed part. And, and expanding beyond that was a, a cost that I didn't think he either, we well, shouldn't say he didn't care about it, but I think he had recognized probably that, that what he did and what the whole canyon represent are much, much, much different endeavors. Um, and, and there was the cost issue. Um, I mean, it took long enough for that little piece, so. <laughs> if it, is this on? Okay. If it will make you feel any better, Mathis also had a problem with elevations. Uh, there was a six foot error. Uh, most of the benchmarks that you'll find in the field, you know, they placed the benchmarks first when they did their survey. You will find that the elevation on them is six feet different from the elevation for that benchmark that's shown on the map. <laughs> Two feet, six feet. Anybody else? Any other questions? Do um, Mathis's, or however you pronounce his name, do do his benchmarks appear on Bradbury's map or on Washburn's? Uh, they map? Prob um, there are. You can see benchmarks notated on the map. Um, I, I I don't know which or 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 whose. Um, but he did mention he did mention in his in his report that he relied on some of the measurements or some of the not benchmarks and some of the leveling done by that crew. Um, but but he did, but I'm not sure discounted is the right word. But he felt most of the stuff that was from 1902, 1903 was it's just it's too old. He had more modern techniques, um, and some of the stuff was, as he said, just it's too far away. So um, did he use some of those original points I, as? I think so, but points? I'm not sure if Hopi and Middle and the other two that he said were adequate for his use were part of. I don't, I don't know. I, if I, I could probably give a list to Dr. Upchurch, who might know if, if there's overlap there. All right, let's give him a round of applause.